Parsons got me on the moon. Jack Parsons got me on the moon. So here we are in 2017, and uh, let's see what happens this year. Good, I think we're heading into very, 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 very interesting times. And we should look with caution, but we also should understand that we don't have to be bound by the realities that are imposed upon us by the psychopathic control grid. It doesn't stop you from being a creative, happy, useful human being, enjoying the magic of reality. Shit will always happen. The thing is to have when shit happens, always make sure that, that it's not it's not just the shit that you have overwhelming you. There's other things in your life. Basically, what I talk about, a psychic infection or a demonic, it depends on what you come from. If you came from a Christian background, you'd see it was the devil was moving through a small town. If it's someone from my background, you would see it as an infection of the psyche. If you would, Even if you were an atheist, you could even see it as a kind of a a disease of the mind or something, how psychic infections spread in small towns, how people infect one another. I was going to share an experience I've had. Now, I've never seen a ghost, but I've seen plenty of entities. That having said that, I don't know what a ghost is. You know, I, I'm pretty sure it's not like a departed person. Uh, I think that's, unless it's a trapped astral corpse, I don't think that's what it is. But I have seen plenty of entities, and like many people have, but they discount them and they ignore them or they think it's a hallucination. When I was in like my, a teenager, I was working in this place in Dublin. And uh, it was a modern building built in the early 70s. And it was a big sports club. And I worked as a dishwasher and a waiter, not a waiter, a, a bus boy, as Americans call them, in the restaurants and in the bar areas. And the place used to close up at night. And... A lot of the pe women who worked there especially were afraid to walk down the corridors late at night. They described seeing, a few of them said they saw a small man with a gigantic head and a deformed face. Now, I had had the, the spooky sensations in this place where I'd work, but I'd never, ever seen anything. I once saw what looked like a black mist beside a telephone in the lobby part of it late one night but i don't know what that was exactly it could have been anything but if that was the only odd thing but every not everybody else but lots of other people who worked there a lot of me are well, dead now many of them but when i was a kid they they a few of them said they saw this little short fella with a huge head and big eyes like um and so i'd never seen him but the way they described them they described them very vividly he was stripped to the waist. He had a pair of trousers that was held up with a a rope. He would just be seen looking down corridors at him and things like this. Scary as shit as that is. About five years ago, I bought a really old map of Dublin. And I discovered there used to be a, a hospital for the incurables 
on the same location. And what it turned out to be was it was a place where all genetic deformed people were put. People who were born with two heads, people who had genetic malfunctions. And they had all been kept in this, this basically this place. And these were awful places. They were places of horror and they were run by probably nuns who sexually molested the, the patients and the kids there. So e either he was a topa generated by that or he was a ghost of something that was trapped there. But the way they described him, he was very solid. And that's the key to these things. If they're very solid, they're not ghosts. They're probably entities. I believe what they saw was a leprechaun. Now, I know it's going to say you all think a leprechaun is like a fella who wears a green suit and a little green cap. But a leprechaun is actually a grotesque monster. That's only Irish Americans who came up with that crap. In fact, it was, you know, that series of movie called Leprechaun from back in the day where, he, you know, so they're quite actually funny, some of those films. I remember when the first Leprechaun horror film came out, I was living in America and all these Irish Americans were all going mental saying it was a negative portrayal of leprechauns. And I was the only voice in the wilderness saying they're portraying them exactly as how Irish people used to see them. They were terrified of them. They were evil, disgusting little monsters, horrible little things. They were not like cute little things like, you know, the lucky charms, pixies or whatever, which is what Americans, Irish Americans thought they were, still think they are. And I think that's what that was. It was some kind of fairy. I think fairies and fairies exist in a world between this world and I would say a kind of a quantum world. And at that quantum world, it's kind of like where gods and other kinds of angelic or higher beings, as they call them, come out. And it was, I did finally see this thing but years later when I was in hospital in Sligo. Now, people who work in hospitals, particularly ones who worked as nurses or as orderlies or as maid, you know, ones who work in the, the administrative staff will tell you that they see things in hospitals all the time. They see weird entities, weird shapes. And indeed, a lot of these Ghost Hunter TV shows, ever notice how many of them have the best success in either so, former psychiatric hospitals or former regular hospitals, as well as jails. But I don't know what happens in these hospitals. You hear stories of people that have been dead walking the corridors. You know, someone sees them. You see, you hear stories of these shapes moving around, these black shapes. You hear all kinds of things. So, so hospitals, because of what happens in them, are very, very psychically charged. And so it's not surprising at all that people have paranormal experiences inside hospitals especially if they're at an emotional a heightened emotional state and there's also maybe drugs involved now in my case drugs were involved but that doesn't mean the drugs caused the hallucination what that means was the drugs allowed me to see between worlds that's what happened now i went in for a basic of an operation i was kind of a mysterious circumstances surrounding that as well well the long and short of it is that my liver became an infection an infection happened and my liver became infected and I became very, very ill. And I was in hospital for a much longer time than I should have been, a long time. And so I was in the hospital and I was actually, you know, they, they took care of me. They, they cut me to bits. I mean, I was absolutely torn. I mean, if you, you look at my chest now, it's healed up a lot now. But I, I mean, I had like scars. Like it, I had scars that were really bad and cuts down the center of my chest. And uh, just to try and cut out the infected tissue. And... So I was on a lot of morphine. I was on an awful lot of morphine to deal with the agony of it. And so uh, as I was coming down from it, I was starting to feel kind of good in the hospital. I was making making friends with the staff. The doctors were very nice. Uh, you know, the nurses were lovely. And, the, and, I, and even the, the, the cleaning staff, the staff had brought around your dinner and your lunch. I was starting to get to know them by name. We were having great chats. That's one of the things I love about Ireland is that the hospitals are especially, well, I don't know how it is in, the, in Dublin, but the smaller regional hospitals are very friendly places. I was in a ward about four other guys because I didn't have private insurance at the time. I was a, uh, I was a public patient, so I had to share a ward with four other, a room with four other guys. That was no big deal. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not a snob. And so the other four guys were all very old then, and it was just me, and that was really, that was always going on. And when they were awake, we'd have chats and stuff, and it was very nice. They were like all farmers and stuff. And so... A day before I was due to release, and I'd been 
very, very clean of the morphine and everything. I was feeling good. I was sitting up in bed in the middle of the afternoon. The sun was shining. Beautiful scenery, beautiful view over the city centre slide going off course the mountains. I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good because, uh, you know, I'm going to go home tomorrow. So I was, I was in a good, I was in good form. And so there was no stress. There was no nothing. Middle of the day, it wasn't the middle of the night. I wasn't asleep. And I was feeling the best I'd felt enough where I was able to go home. I knew I was able to go home. And so, and then something, probably the most incredible experience of my life happened. And I have never publicly spoken about this. I even told the doctor about it. And he said to me, it's, it's, it's unusual how extreme your one was. But he says, you can't explain. He said, no, it's definitely not the morphine. The morphine, in some some people's cases, do have these visions. But you had been off the morphine for two or three days and you were just waiting for your stitches to be cleaned up and the tubes and everything to be pulled out of you. So now, first of all, I wasn't asleep. Secondly, I wasn't in a stressful state. I was relaxed, chilled out. I'd been reading a magazine. I was in a good form and... No problem. I had my lunch and all that stuff. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon, and this was in June 2010, I think. Sitting there in the bed, in the hospital, sitting upright, a little bit bored. Now, what makes this remarkable is I was talking to a friend on the phone as it was happening. I was describing the experience, and I was also drawing the images into my journal. That's how lucid I was. This was not a semi-lucid or a dream-like state. This was as, as, as real as I'm talking to you at this very moment when this stuff was going on. Now, I'm, I was actually talking and texting to somebody as this was happening. Sitting up in bed, I put my hands behind my neck, just like set a, a bit of a yawn let out, and then these monkey men, just like I described the period in that place where I worked years ago, four of them, Huge heads, big, huge eyes. They literally came into the hospital ward out of nothing. But they entered in, and I'm not kidding you, it was like the, fe the little fellas in Time Bandits. It was just like them. They came in a little huddled group out, and they were dressed just like the woman said, the woman that in the old place where I worked years ago said this monkey man was dressed with trousers held up with a rope and no shirt on top. Huge, gigantic head, small, stumpy body, right? They came out of the air. And when they came out of the air, were they fully manifested? No, I could kind of, I could see through them. So they were kind of like, you remember in the Star Wars first movie where someone's messing with, RT, R2-D2, and it projects a hologram of Princess Leia. Well, it looked like that. It looked You could see through it, but it was there. But it wasn't, they were, it wasn't, but the, they came out of the mist and ran towards me, ran to the edge of my bed, and were looking at me in such a way they were trying to see me, as if they couldn't see me properly. The heads were turned sideways. I know you're thinking this is, this is the madness. This is what actually happened. They were staring and peering as if they're trying to see me. And then they kind of stopped as if they'd realized something and turned around and went back. Now, I wasn't frightened during this. I was more amazed. In fact, as I was texting my friend when this was happening and they were laughing on the other end, but they were saying, I can't, I can't believe how calm you are. I said, I'm not frightened. And so that they, it was almost like they had run to come and get me to capture me or to meet me when they saw I wasn't who they were waiting for or I wasn't available or what I wasn't, I was suddenly not interesting to them. They walked away. So I sit back and I go to myself, what just happened? I'm laughing. I'd had enough experience with hallucinogenics. I knew enough about magic and conjuring and invocation, bringing forth entities. I knew exactly what was happening here. I was not, I was not freaked out because if I maybe was a, a Christian who only knew like the Bible or something, I'd probably be on my knees screaming. But because I immediately knew that I was having either a hallucination, a very good one, 
or I was encountering entities. I had no doubt about it. I immediately knew that they were entities that were coming into, the, into this reality. Now, from that, I sit back, and it gets even more bizarre. I sit back, and then I look upwards at the ceiling of the hospital. Uh, because the, cor- the curtain had been drawn night, like three quarters around my bed. I was at the bed at the window. So I was co- completely, you could only, all I could see was straight ahead of me and to the right out the window. I couldn't see the left, the rest of the ward because the man beside me had pulled his curtain across. He didn't want sunlight. He was trying to sleep. And I leaned back and put my head upright. And then it starts, something else begins to happen. I start to see something forming. That's about nine feet tall. And its back is turned to me. And I look up in the bed and there was, now I didn't know his name at the time, but there was the Egyptian god with the head of the crocodile. I know this sounds absolutely bonkers and out there, but I'm telling you, this is what I saw. I saw Sobek, the the Egyptian god. I had no interest in Egyptian religion, still don't have a great interest in it, or Egyptian mythology. So it wasn't a prompt from reading books or watching or anything like that. I had very little knowledge of this stuff. My See, most of my experience at magic has not been through things like the OTO or Athelim or even the Golden Dawn. And my interest in magic has almost exclusively been through European folk magic, peasant folk magic, what they call cunning folk. In the old days, that was the, always the magical school that did and still appeals to me. And that is not rooted to that is not particularly at all rooted in Hermetic Egyptian or any kind of Nile based Nile Valley based archetypes. None at all. So this thing is huge. It's standing beside me. I get up and I turn around and look at it. And it looks at me with such absolute contempt. You're such a maggot. You're so nothing, but not in a vicious or a a vicious or a hateful or a a de- dangerous way. It was almost like I was getting a an ass whooping. Like you better become a man. You better get your life. It was that that kind of thing, like a dissing, a dressing down. Is what I was getting, and it was there. It was real. I saw it. Call me mad. I don't care. This is what happened. So there it was. I'm thinking to myself, there's this Egyptian god. At the time, I didn't know his name. From this, he points towards three arches that appear. The three arches appear, and I can see into the distance a landscape. These arches looked like, I don't know what they look like. They just look arches, right? And then from these arches, which had all these kind of gold and red uh, sort of like fluting and coving on them and stuff like that, decorative forms. I walk through the center arch. And like, I, mean, I mean, I physically, in an astral form, my body was still in the bed, but my spirit, my, my, S, my being, had left my body and went through the central arch. And then what happened then? I was inside the center of the sun. Something told me I was inside the center of the sun. And what don't know what I got that from. That's the impression I got. And inside the center of the sun, the whole interior was covered with all the ancient writings of the world. Omstrip, runes, Hebrew, Babylonian cruciform, Egyptian hieroglyphs. And right in the middle, right in the center. Now, I think some of you Christians are probably going to love this. I don't know what it means. Was Hebrew. Hebrew was almost being, was the central language. It was, there was the four letters of the Tetragrammaton. There was the four letters of God, Yahweh, were right there in the middle of this sun type thing, surrounded by all the other writings of the world inside this giant dome. My astral form was trapped within, or not trapped, was in. At the same time this is going on, I feel myself in my bed. I was, I can't, it's it, it's one of these experiences you can't explain. You just can't explain what was going on. What was specifically important about the writing on the inside of the sun, and as black now, as the, the interior of the sun was black, was that the lettering was in a kind of a fire of red. They were written in kind of a bloody red firing flame. 
And as I said, the Hebrew one was the major one. That was the central one. And all the others were around that. And the covering the inside of this dome. Then I'm back in the hospital bed. And then I'm in, no, then it's over. Don't ask me how long it lasted. It probably only lasted a few minutes. Then I frantically call up my friend and tell him about it and text about it. Uh, in this bizarre, I drew the pictures. I have them all in my book. I'm not going to reveal it to the world yet. They're also very badly drawn because it was it was not easy to draw at that point. It was just wasn't there. It was just enough so I wouldn't forget in case it was a hallucination. Thinking it was a hallucination uh, at the time, coupled with something I knew that I knew I knew part of it was real. I didn't know how much of it was real. Now, why would Sobek, the Egyptian crocodile god, appear to me? That's what I don't understand. Why did he appear to me? Something I had no interest in, something I knew nothing about, but the God was there. I had that Crowley and Rose moment where I actually was drawn into this, this other reality. He had his Toth moment, I had my Sobek moment. The encounter was with fairies, demons, and a God. That's what I experienced, right? Sobek, in Exodus, Moses saw the transformation of the burning bush Nakasha, which means snake. However, in the in the in the late in the Hebrew accounts, the term is Taninin, T A N N I N, which means crocodile. So the King James Bible incorrectly phrases that it wasn't Moses' encounter with a snake, it was Moses' encounter with a crocodile. Sobek represents as a crocodile the symbolic strength of the river Nile and the pharaonic apparatus. An extremely, he's an extremely ancient archetype. He goes, his worship and his cult began in the Old Kingdom and ran right into, well into Roman times, well into Roman times. But at the middle, the Middle Kingdom, he was the primary deity of ancient Egypt, particularly in the Fayum region of Egypt. The Pharaoh Amen M. Henet, the fourth of the 12th dynasty, was so enchanted by Sobek that he built cities to him, including one called Crocodopolis. In Ezekiel, the great satanic entity of Egypt is known as the Great Crocodile. What is the the energetic force of Sobek? He brings peace through destruction, completion. He brings peace through terror. The whole thing of like the the sword keeps peace. Well, that's what Sobek does. He's the protector of the, he's the protector of the ones who need protecting, but he uses his ferocity. See, as crocodiles are the only reptiles in those times that was known to take care of its young, the crocodile puts its young into its jaws of its mouth and swims around. That was symbolic of Sobek's power. He was the protector of the weak, the protector of the fragile but he uses ferocious danger to do it. And also on a subconscious archetype level, he's a very power of the crocodile animal itself without even going to Sobek. Very, very interesting. He's 66 teeth and underwater, he can, they can grow to enormous sizes. He has incredible, the crocodile, he, she has incredible underwater stealth. Despite its enormous size and huge tail, if you're standing on the banks of the Nile, it can literally come out right up to the, the very edge of the water without being seen or making a ripple on the surface. And then run out at incredible speed and ferocity using its tail almost like a rocket to launch itself out of the Nile and it will take down its prey. It will pull it under the water. A crocodile has where it will be digested. And that's also to do with the whole idea of the Jungian subconscious under the water, down below. And there's so much stomach acid inside a crocodile that everything is digested. Nothing, even clothes, shoes. The acid is so strong, bones. Everything is digested by the crocodile. Allegorical level, on the kind of archetypal level, the crocodile represents absolute and total sublimation into the underworld, the subconscious world. He's fierce to protect the innocent. Now, about the the attributes of the god Sobek himself, who basically, I suppose, from that point on, 
became the entity that I should be worshipped. Sobek is also known as Sebek. In Crowley's Libra 777 is Key 32. He's the final path of wisdom. Now, this was important in the way he looked at me. He was looking at me. I almost, is a part of my life where I almost, okay, let's just say these are hallucinations, that the God didn't appear. And the God doesn't exist, right? But my subconscious mind generated this stuff, these archetypes, in order to help me. Let's look on it this way, okay? I was being very ill. I had basically wasted my life. Well, I hadn't wasted my life. I mean, I'd done a lot, but I was basically at the end of a long period of being a waste of space. I wasn't really doing much. I wasn't doing much. I was just, I wasn't, shall we say, I've, I've been born with certain gifts and certain talents and abilities. All I was doing was working regular jobs. I wasn't bringing it to the wider world. My knowledge things I'd read about psychopaths, things I read about the occult, things I read about magic. I never, I just, if I found an odd person to talk about them, I spoke about it. Otherwise, it was inside me and it wasn't helping anybody else. And that's why Sobek looked at me like that. He was saying, you are a waste of space. You have all this potential and you haven't brought it to completion. And what was, and I almost died because I was sick too. Now, in the tarot, he represents the world card. And that's significant because that was the end of a cycle in my life. It was over. It was done with. And it was time to move on. In the tot, he appears on the wheel card, the wheel of fortune card, the fortune card at the bottom. At the bottom of the wheel. And that's very apt as well because he represented me at my kind of lowest point then to try and start me again. And he's pictured in that card very similar to how I saw him. Bringing down his numerology to 21. Key 32, 21, and he is the world card. The completion of the cycle. The completion of the cycle. He's uh, ruled by Saturn and the Sun and Horus. He's also indicative of the Hebrew letter Tav, which means con- protection and completion. I was being whooped ass because I did not accept my burden with dignity. The vision was an indication for me to not only study more and study harder, but to get my stuff out there in the world. I was not delivering what I wasn't helping humanity. I wasn't helping at all. Now, this is before I wrote the book on psychopaths or anything. Self or collective redemption of my judgment into the world. Tav, the Hebrew letter, also represents a state of humility. In that of the fool, it's the fool who fails to recognize a great gift. And that's exactly what was happening. It wasn't arrogance for the sake of it. It was arrogance. And this was, this is because I was failing to understand what my own life purpose was. Sure, I played in band. Sure, I'd done this, that and the other. But I hadn't really done anything to contribute to my, my story in the world. That's happening now. But I wasn't at the time. Now, I wasn't being called by some god. This is what's happened. Don't, don't, this is not what's happening. I wasn't being summoned by a higher power because I was special. This was nothing like that. This was purely my subconscious mind doing this to me, invoking these energetic archetypes as an Egyptian god. See, the primary objective of magic is to make reality dissolve into plasticity. And that's what happened to me that day. But it was the plasticity of the, this world became placid, became, became malleable. And I was able to get into other realms. And within this malleability of the magic reconstruction of reality, new potentials and outcomes can be created. A magnetic field which can attract or repel you because it directly communicates with the subconscious mind. It's invisible to the eye and touch, and is only made manifest by the effects upon objects around it or con- you know, uh, connected to it, like a crystals or something, bringing something forward, or drawing a magic circle or a magic triangle. And it's nothing, none of this can be brought about with a kind of, without a kind of a devil's blessing. Yin cannot be resolved without yang. The greatest gift that life can give give you is be, being betrayed 
by what your beliefs or your mentor, or in the case of your guru, or even yourself, if you become a guru to yourself, which is guess what kind of what happened to me. When you sort of like settled in your life and not doing anything, the universe, you're almost becoming a guru of yourself. You're thinking like, oh, well, I'm subconsciously, you're thinking, all right, I know it all. I'm already sorted. And the universe will give you that kick up the hole. It'll give it to you. You will be harvested by thunderbolts. It will happen. That's what happened to me. That was the beginning of my path seeing these visions, seeing this, this this experience. I know I'm not insane. Thinking I wasn't a drug addict. I've never been an alcoholic or anything like that. And I know I, I was fine. I was absolutely fine. My body had been fixed, but my, my subconscious wasn't. I wasn't living up to my potential. And I think that's why a lot of these things happen. There was a an Irish saint called Matt Talbot, and he was a ferocious alcoholic. And then he had a vision of the Virgin Mary in an alleyway in Dublin. And he became an instant taking the pledge, teetotaler. And to, and to punish himself for all the things he had done to people, for being an alcoholic, he strapped himself with chains and walk, made himself walk around in agony. Kind of an S&M thing. And when he died and they took his clothes off, they found that, that he had, he'd been torturing himself with chains. And the Catholics loved this shit. But the reality was, it's not what he should have done. What use was he doing torturing himself with chains? You know, because and that's the thing with the, the Catholic and the Christian redemption. You don't actually do anything but other people. You just suffer. And it, suffering alone is no use. You've got to get out there and add your bit to the, your ignition to the, to the matrix, to the reality. And it was literally, uh, quite literally, when I got home from hospital is when I began the first drafts of the book Puzzling People. So, an Egyptian god inspired me to write a book about psychopaths. And when you think about it, that's what it was, protecting the innocent with ferocity and bring it to the world. As mad as that sounds, but this is like, listen, this, don't we hear these stories in science all the time? Eureka moments and things like that. The strangest things can cause to change your life in a radical direction. I'm sure many people listen to this have had strange experiences like that. They've had strange events in their lives that became so significant that it ended up changing everything, everything. And suddenly they were, they were participating in this reality in a much healthier way. Now people laugh at me and say things. Have you seen, you know, you think you've seen proofs of fairies? Oh yeah, I've seen them. I know people have seen them and I've seen, you know, I, I was calling them demons for years. The ones that first appeared in that vision. But, and also that little the guy with the big head monkey man that I spoke about years ago. But I think that's absolutely what they were. I didn't fully understand how grotesque these these fairies and leprechauns are because I've still been programmed from it. But that's what he was. I was just calling them demons. I was just calling them, that's what I was calling them, demons. Or elementals is another common one. But that's a, he's a common one. He appears. Uh, some old Irish stately homes, the same kind of the form dwarf they call them but they're not actually dwarfs they're elementals or they're, they're they're fairies or something they exist i don't give a shit if you don't believe it or not they exist i saw an egyptian god was it really there well i don't know that for certain but i can tell you something it was as clear as anything when i was looking at it it wasn't produced by my subconscious mind as a vision probably maybe almost certainly does that mean it has, it has no value no that means it has tremendous value it has tremendous value you see this is one of the things the transhumanist and the atheist and all these other types do to people is when people have these incredible magical experiences and insights they tell them ah it was just a, something was wrong with your mind it was a, a production of some chemicals you had an hallucination you're mentally unstable and yet these people would are probably being these people are probably the shamans of the future i wonder how many people in psychiatric hospitals in a rubber room being pumped full of drugs and uh wearing a straight jacket are our future shamans. I really do wonder that. I really I really do wonder, are we destroying our shamans? And if so, is it being done deliberately? Are our visionaries of the future being destroyed? Are they being ripped to bits? And this has been a long-term thing. See, remember, who started all these kinds of institutions? The Christian churches, under the guise of charities. Oh, we'll help the afflicted. The, we'll help the ones who are afflicted by mind problems 
oh, we'll help the people who are not, you know, they've, they're melancholy or they've lost their mind. And they, this is a great way for the church to shut down any kind of pagan revival. Because as the shamans were awakened, all they have to do is declare them as insane and lock them up. Like St. Bernadette, I have had a shamanic experience in Lourdes. Immediately, immediately, the Catholic Church steals it and claims that she saw the Virgin Mary. Bernadette has never said once that she said that, ever. She just said it was a lady. And the same with the kids in Fatima. They said it was a woman. They didn't say it was the Virgin Mary. The church immediately co-opted it. And those kids in Fatima and Portugal were telling the truth because the miracle of the sun that happened on that final day when the sun came down in the sky is documented and indisputable. It happened. But again, the churches have stolen these ideas. They've stolen these things. These are supposed to be very powerful experiences for the individuals who experience them. In, but if you have a prevailing dogma or a church type operation or something like the Catholic Church, it's extremely important for them to take control of it and own it and say it was the Virgin Mary or was this, that and the other. It was this, that and the other. Like, for instance, near here, there's a shrine called Nock. Now, Nock is where the Virgin Mary and a lot of saints were supposed to appear. But there's, not, there's a local sort of story that going back to the 1870s, that some kids are messing with a railway light in the area and illuminated these shadow forms onto the side of the walls, almost having fun. And then somebody in the area thought that, that they'd seen visions of the Virgin Mary and a few other saints on the side of this church in Knock. The kids never came forward because, well, they would have been in trouble. And that's now a big industry today, this bizarre looking basilica and this is people have these experiences all the time and they immediately discount them i know many people who are atheists they would tell me the most amazing stories including one woman who's a scientist who when her husband divorced her she was sitting in her living room one day and a ufo and a, a spaceship appeared in her living room a thing about 10 feet wide was in her, and then I said to her, well, what do you think of that? Oh, it was just a hallucination from my, from the stress I was under. And I said, would you not think that it could have been, I'm not saying aliens, but it could have been some kind of message from your subconscious mind telling you to do something or had, had some kind of special significant meaning for you at that time? Oh, don't be ridiculous. That stuff isn't true. And this happens all the time. All the, I, I, I can guarantee you I can go down to the pub tonight and, and I can start a conversation with anybody anywhere in the world at a cafe. And I'd say, to them, did anything ever really strange ever happen to you? And, then, and within a few minutes, they'll say, oh, yeah, like one day I was walking down this road and I saw this, this thing like a giant. It looked like a giant cat and it followed me. And, this, and what happened then? It just vanished. So what do you think that was? Ah, I was probably just imagining things or seeing things. And yet they're probably experiencing the most significant event of their lives. People don't even write down dreams. I'm always telling people to keep their dream diaries, keep them open. People have these experiences all the time. And they're told, oh, it's just a trick of the light. Oh, it's just imagination. Oh, it didn't, it didn't really happen. Oh, you were going through a bad time. Oh, you were a bit, you, you got a bit psychic. But these are like shamanic insights they were having. They were having rips in the matrix. And that's what I had that day. And I wasn't going to go home. Now, I did tell, ask the doctor. I did tell the doctor about it. And he just said to me, I don't worry about it. It's, it happens very commonly coming after off morphine. And I says, but I've been off morphine now for a couple of days. And he says, yeah, I know. It doesn't make sense. But I wouldn't worry about it. There's nothing wrong with you. And, I, you know, he was okay with it. But he just he just he discounted it. But he talked to, again, talk to anyone you know that's worked in a hospital for a long time. In fact, anyone who knows these stories, can you, can you post them in the comments below here in the, in the YouTube comments? I, want, I really want to see them. I really want to read them. Because I could, I could tell you one other story that happened to me, but I can't resolve it because it's very personal. But it was an amazing thing. And it was, it was the other side. It was my 
my encounter with the dark forces or the other forces or with the diamonic reflections or whatever, it happened to me in a different way. In a very roundabout, convoluted way that took years and years and years to resolve. But my God, it was unbelievable how it happened. Explore this stuff further and deeper and more. I want to know more and more about these things. I want to develop a more intelligent understanding and insight and, and encourage that with other people. There'll be many more years of the velocity of now coming. So here we are at the 15th of July 2015. Someone who believes very much in the bardic satirical magic idea that humour and satire is a fantastic way of relieving the tension. Now, it, people are saying to themselves, oh, it's a shit time and things are not going well, very disruptive and so on like that. But you have to understand, these are natural, normal cycles. And it's your relationship and your reaction to them is what determines the outcome. It's like when you're, a wave comes at a wave comes and you're out at sea or on a surfboard or on a rowing boat. If the wave comes at you, you can either turn your boat sideways to it and try to stop it, which you won't, or you can turn your boat or your surfboard pointing towards the beach and you ride that wave. And that's the way you do and, and these psychic interferences are the same way too. They work exactly the same way. Now, I see them as when a shock or a, something incredible happens to you that's tremendously disruptive in your life, suddenly and quickly, what that is, is let's use, let's use mythology and allegory and metaphor here. That is the god Thor. This is the tarot card in the tarot, by the way. The tarot card in the tarot is all about having the slate wiped clean. A sudden shock out of the blue that rattles and destroys the ego. That's its purpose within the in the major arcana. And the tar the tower comes after you've built up your personality, you've built up your social mask, your ego and everything else. You've built up your sense of what you believe is your own self identity. And then it's in the tarot it's actually Lucifer. Uh, but it's also because the tarot is uniquely the only thing on earth that's based on many archetypes it's also the hammer of thor the hammer of thor it's purity it that bolt of lightning that strikes say a tree let's think let's put it in the analogy of a tree because i'm thinking a lot about trees lately i cut down some of my property and i was doing some pruning and stuff like that and i was thinking about trees you think of like this time of year when we have the, the, the hot weather, the buildup of pressure, the buildup of static electricity and the discharges from clouds towards the earth. Most, most commonly they will strike trees. Now you think, say you're a tree, right? And Thor decides to hit you. That lightning bolt comes from the clouds, flies down from Valhalla, hits the tree. And what does it do? It doesn't kill the tree. A tree is rarely killed by lightning, but anything around the tree is usually destroyed, like animals grazing and things like that. But more importantly, the the bad parts of the tree are knocked off. You have limbs that are rotten away or diseased or infected, and they're shocked off by the flash of lightning. You have all birds' nests. The birds aren't nesting this time of years, so it doesn't matter to them. So they've already had their hatchlings and they're gone. And they will fly out of the tree. Now all this matter will plummet from the top of the tree down towards the ground in fire. It will hit the ground and its ashes will then provide nutrients for the tree to grow again. New nutrients that previously wasn't there. And that's how it is. This is what's happening. When you have these disruptive periods in, in the matrix, like so many of us seem to be appear, uh, having at the moment, these strange sudden manifestations and paradigms that are, see, at first seem like a shock. What you have to realize is it's no big deal. What this is, is Thor firing a thunderbolt at your tree. The rotten limbs, the decayed matter, the parasites and the old nests are all sent out of the tree in a burst of fire they land on the ground the ashes decay and new nutrients are fed into your roots and you grow even stronger and taller and we were never we we're never told these things in school i did a i did a talk there recently in australia i wasn't in australia 
uh, with some people at a poetry in a poetry uh, circle, and I, I, I described it just as that that the purpose of mythology is to compensate for realities and things that happen in the real world, a form of comparative analytical psychology that allow you to deal with the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And when you can start to process things these this way, you don't resort to paranoia, hysteria, smear campaigns, witch hunts, contacting people like a, trying to turn them against them and looking like a bigger lunatic than you think you do. Uh, surrounding yourself with the mentally unstable and the unhealthy because that's not a winning game because instead of letting the, letting the dice fall letting the rotten branches fall to the ground what you're doing is you're denying evolution and evolution is stagnation evolution is entropy and evolution is death so if you find yourself in your life at this point at the moment if you had some difficult weeks Laugh it off, joke it off, and that's what will turn your surfboard or your your sailboat perpendicular to the wave, and you'll cruise down back to the shore and begin again. Because remember, everything is cyclical in nature. Now, tonight's show is going to be a, a feckin' interesting one. I've come up with some amazing in, info lately. But firstly, I want to talk about the energy cycles at the moment, and this relates to the dreams things that I've been talking about. The dream show last week was uh, had an absolutely phenomenal response. Of all the shows I've done on this stuff since I've ever started doing radio shows, I don't think any show has ever had the impact, caused the most amounts of emails, letters, and private messages that last week's show on what is sleep caused. But there was one dream I had last night that I want to tell you about because... It's specifically important to me as a person. I've been dreaming, a lot of my dreams revolve around me and going into buildings. It's been like this all my life. I think I spoke on a previous show about a dream that I had about a house at the corner of two streets. And I only went into the ground floor of this, initially of the, of the house. And I knew there was absolute and horrific evil on the second and third floors. It was an Amityville horror, American kind, you know those American kind of houses that like the, the Adams Family house have two or three floors, or they have two floors and a fitted out attic, a fully furnished fitted out attic, uh, that style of American kind of house on a corner, which is very significant with a lawn around it on both sides. And so a crossroads essentially. And so when I went into this house, the downstairs of the house was barren and empty. It had no, it was nothing, it wasn't disruptive or wrecked or anything like that. It was just had no furnishings, no nothing in it, no pictures on the wall. But upstairs was full of amazing stuff and stuff I needed to get, okay? It was stuff that I, uh, I had to get my hands on, treasures, things I needed. Uh, in, intellectual ideas, books, all kinds of maps. Maps were very common in it. All kinds of things like that. But it had this sense of evil on the second floor and the third floor, especially the third floor, the upper fitted out, you know, attic roof area, that was shockingly disturbing. Now, we spoke last week about when you're in a dream state, is this the other side of us? another aspect or version of your reality and yes i think these dreams these series of dreams of me on the street very 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 much was that now it makes me wonder too we'll talk about this in a different matter later on the show but it makes me wonder too if ghosts are not the spirits of the departed but are in fact people who are asleep in your house They're in that sleep traveling state. Now, it's different than astral traveling, and it's absolutely different than these things have taken ayahuasca and these shamanic medicines. Because remember, people in dreams come back with information that happens. Where someone who goes on ayahuasca, jungle juice, or shrooms, you don't come back with any kind of future messages. You don't come back with any kind of like things that come true. And certainly, I've never met or heard of one person who does, I'm not one that astral projection, I'm sure it's true, that has done astral projection and come back with a prediction of the future. I've not heard it.
But yet all of us have a, have a precognitive, precognitive dreams of things that happened in the future that we witnessed in the dream beforehand and came true. That's happened all of us. Either it's happened in very clear and succinct metaphor, like there wasn't just like you have to really dig the meaning out, or it's we've absolutely seen it as it really is. This only happens in dreaming, which would suggest that the only the only aspect of human extra, shall we say, extra sensory, extra consciousness uh, traveling that's real that we can actually say is absolutely one hundred percent real is dreaming. Because we can actually bring back information of what's going to happen in the future in dreaming. Nothing else does that. Now this is so powerful. And this would also explain why dreams have been degraded and belittled by the man. The man wants us all on... Those of you who say, oh, we have to all take ayahuasca because they don't want the masses from taking ayahuasca because man if we take the ayahuasca the, the, then the, the matrix man will really fall apart if that's true why are they pushing that shit in our face constantly think about that one why are they pushing the ayahuasca jungle juice stuff in our face constantly if it's really going I'm going to wake the masses up man I'm going to wake I'm going to wake I'm going to wake the masses up that's like cutting your dick off to prove you're not sexist. Man, I, I worship the Yanni. I worship the Yanni, man. And I, I had my penis removed to worship the goddess. That's what that's like. That's the same rational thing. Nothing comes out of the ayahuasca thing. And people are just as much bigger di big, big dicks as they were before they went in. Same with all the, all those drugs, everything. Even heavy cannabis use. Is it with Tico or is it weeds Tico? Now, I'm not putting down people to smoke smoke the weed. That's their own business. But uh, any kind of thing from alcohol, sniffing glue, too much pot, too much anything, uh, ayahuasca. That's absolutely no doubt about that. And, you, and so, uh, these, these, so the, real, the only real shamanic, shall we say, and I put that in quotations because I don't really mean it isn't that, but the only really transcendental extra consciousness state that can really produce results is dreaming and we all do it and we don't have to pay a drug dealer or the CIA traffic and stuff out of uh, Arkansas to get there we don't have to do that you know we don't have to pay somebody you know for our shamanic medicine that resulted in somebody in Kingstown Jamaica having their head pumped full of bullets you know, so we can feel all, all spiritual, man. I'm so spiritual. And I can tell you for a fact, down in, down, in, down in Peru, we haven't heard from it yet, but we will, that all the ayahuasca jungle juice groups are all probably doing hits on each other, just like cocaine dealers, to get some of that money that's coming down that way. So, yeah, I, you, I don't care if you inject yourself with shoe polish. That's your own business. But I'm telling you, for a fact, the only transcendental state that we can actually say for sure produces results is dreaming now so i always had this dream of the house and it on the second floor and it having a sense of pure evil and then in the last year or so i've been able to go to the top of this house uh, to the roof and the second floor and actually find things and useful things that i get to the second floor i no longer get the sense of t tremendous evil anymore I no longer get the sense of tremendous uh, fear anymore. I no longer get the sense of pain and the, this sense of evil that came with the second and third floors. And this week, it's been the exact opposite. Wow, it's been just unbelievable. Last night, I had a dream whereby I was on the roof of a brownstone building I used to live in in New York. That was in a bad neighborhood. I mean, it really was. It really was when I lived there. It wasn't a terrible neighborhood, but it was a neighborhood that was not, you know, shall we say, des res. But I lived there because it was fantastic rent, and it was only across the river from Manhattan. So rather than living in Manhattan and spending an absolute fortune on rent, I was spending like five hundred dollars a month living in a beautiful brownstone building, beautiful apartment. 
that you'd probably pay if it was across the river in the Manhattan it would probably be two or three thousand for the same same space and and, and just having to deal with the the whole thing of walking down the street you know walking down the street and Puerto Rican and Colombian guys going yeah uh, the white man and all this but they would never harm you and and especially after I started to shop when well, I was shopping at the bodegas and stuff they would like learn to respect you and and almost like even protect you so that's it but anyway I was in the dream I was on the roof of that building okay and the building was had been completely restored I had a dream about this building a few weeks ago and I was inside the building and the dream had been inside the building the building had been completely restored and the neighborhood cleaned up and to my amazing amazement I went online and discovered that the neighborhood has been cleaned up but not gentrified it's been taken over by Nepalese and Tibetans who've actually turned into a little kind of Nepal and opened up all the restaurants where all the rich people from Manhattan go over to have Nepalese and Tibetan meals so they can be all trendy and say have you ever eaten goat's yak soup and shit like that and the neighborhood is like uh, it's, 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 it's totally considered safe and uh, respectable now because it has all these trendy restaurants so that was interesting enough, but I was walk but this latest train, I was on the roof of the building, okay? And on the roof of the building inside a kind of a room was a laundrette, a laundromat as the Americans call them. All the, like what many which many of those apartment buildings in America have. And there was a woman working in there, and there was all washing machines and dryers. And I went over to her and it was like she was like the Virgin Mary or something. If that what well, the Virgin Mary was was well she would say she was like Freya. She was full of beauty and love. She was a middle aged woman, full of beauty and love. And uh she showed me how to clean my clothes, how to wash them, how to put them in the dryer, and what kind of coins I would need, and how to do all this kind of thing. And I was the only one in this room, in in this beautiful like laundrette. My beautiful laundrette. Remember that film with uh, Daniel Day Lewis when he before he started out. And uh, the clothes represent the same thing I spoke about at the beginning of the show: the washing away of the filth and dirt, the removal of particulates and uh, and and toxins. And that was very apparent in the dream last night. Very very apparent. Because we, we predominantly speak English, and we speak in the English language, we never really know about investigations of the 40 and ideas and things like this in other languages, in other societies. And this is often a, an unfortunate thing because we miss out on a lot. You know, we get we we tend to get very ghettoized in believing that the English world, speaking world is where all this stuff happens. But it goes on all over the world. Now, I never heard about this guy until last week. And his name is George Hygen. G-E-O-R-G-H-Y-G-E-N. Now, you may ask yourself, who is this guy? Well, he was, he lived between 1908 and 1994. And he was the professor of botany at the Norwegian Agricultural University. Now, what? on top of the fact that he was a professor of botany, he was, in the 1960s, the most ardent uh, opposer to water fluoridation of the water supply in Norway. And he was the most inter instrumental voice in preventing fluoridation of water in Norway. He was not a crank. He was not an activist. He was a very, very, very well respected professor, academic. Now, the reason why he was so ardently against the fluoridization of water was because of one other thing. Not only was he one of Norway's foremost intellectuals through his long life, I'm talking about this guy was the Stephen Hawkins, Hawkins of, of, of Norway. Not only was he that, but he was also a parapsychology, and he was the chairman of the Norwegian Society for Parapsychology. 
between 1955 and 1963 and again 1992 and 1993. His work was so influential and so yielded such tremendous results in the scientific way that he approached it that he was the basically he was the also the impetus for the British Society of uh, Psychical Research which counted which uh, which modeled their own society on the work he had done in Norway the idea was that this was an intellectual look at parapsychology using scientific methods and not coming from a shall we say a fruity or a, a kind of a woo-woo way but from a very this is in the days before that piece of shit Richard Dawkins came along and you know morons are watching Mythbusters DVDs and think I'm a science man I'm a I'm into science I, I, I practice reason I practice reason you know while they're watching the Myth, 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 Mythbusters DVD and saying ah, we, we gotta get the top of our son's penis chopped off and circumcised because we practice reason you know those types right but before those days existed into and before the witch hunt happened against intellectuals such as Rupert Sheldrake who actually look into these things was going on especially out, outside the English speaking world George Hygen Hygen, sorry, was uh, was not only a, 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 you know a parapsychology researcher, entirely intellectual, but his own group had members such as Harold uh, Schillendup, a double professor of philosophy and psychology, or the classic text on psychic phenomena called Daishuka Menenske, the Hidden Man. Now, his work into clairvoyance, dreams parapsychology and human intuition was the direct reason why he was so vehemently against the fluoridation of water in Norway he had stumbled upon the fact that what these people tell us about the pineal gland being calcified by fluoridation affecting our spirituality as the new ager said it doesn't it doesn't affect our spirituality it affects our clairvoyance and our extrasensory perception it also heavily affects our dreaming because it alters and destroys melatonin production and this has been scientifically validated which destroys dreaming and destroys the power of dreaming now we're starting to look down the fluoridation rabbit hole in a very 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 different way while the truth mafia while the 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 mainstream truth heroes pushed these ideas that fluoridation fluoridation was done by the nazis in the concentration camps to make us docile not true absolutely not true and it's not in the book the crimes of ig farben which is often re referenced and that it makes us docile I don't think it does I don't think it makes it does docile the only thing that you can really hardcore put your finger on regarding fluoridization of water is its effect on the production of melatonin from the pineal gland in the brain and this affecting sleeping and dreaming cycles now it's well known that if people stop dreaming they go into psychosis this has been well known for about 50 years that people who stop dreaming become psychotic look around you look at the fluoridated countries people are crazy people are batshit crazy more that people are docile humans are docile everywhere by nature but look at the United States, look at Ireland, look at Canada, look at Australia, look at anywhere that's fluoridated. These are dysfunctional societies on some level. Why are areas where you have strong, shall we say, cultural types, Ireland is targeted, the Basque region in Spain, 
why of all the places outside Ireland did they go for is where the Irish came from, the Basque region? N North America. Not only do you have the many immigrant groups there, but the Native Americans, the Aborigines in Australia. The dream time, folks. Someone somewhere in the past figured out that if they could interrupt human dreaming, they could do something to us. They could make us insane, unsane, psychotic and lead us into the abyss and this i'm now starting to believe is the real purpose of fluoridation it robs us of our participation with the exterior hidden side of us the extrasensory part of our being that travels in dreams has premonitions moves outside our body that's what they're after why? Because when you take that away, you take us, you, you turn us into a robot. Someone said to me last week that the ego was the first stage of transhumanism. I totally see that. It was. The first stage of transhumanism was the ego. Now we need the ego, just like we need modern medicine, just, you know, most, some of the time, just like we need technology. But the ego was the first stage of transhumanism because previous to that we would have communicated through verbal cues and so on so there's been a definite progression to remove the instinctual archetypal human from us because the more robotic we are the more less the less magical we are and this is going right back to the roman empire the more we can be controlled and if you take away your dreams, you remove those dreams, well, we lose the magic. Because look how many eureka moments in science have come from dreams. Look how many songs, I think it was Paul McCartney, and I'm not a Beatles fan, but I do like the song Yesterday. And Paul McCartney said he woke up one morning with the song Yesterday humming in his head. And he had it as a dream the night before. And he was sure that someone else must have written it. Well, it was the other side of him in the other side of his reality before he destroyed his brain with pop, pot and becoming a weed head and writing the shit music of Wings and all this crap solo stuff. Before I did all that, that was the, that was the other side of him in the non-floridated, non-pot up weed, weed, uh, weed, weed head state coming up with that song in the other version of him. So that's why you have to be careful with alcohol and pot and all this stuff. These are not helping you move beyond the state. They're actually stopping you because dreaming is the answer. Not the false, not the false transcendental thing. Our ancestors did not take mushrooms often. They may have taken psychedelics to go into warlike states like berserkers. Most of the time, drumming was sufficient. Fire at night, dancing and chanting was sufficient, but nothing was more powerful than dreaming. Dreaming is the true shamanic path. Now, one of the things that George Huygen was famous for, and I've only found this out recently, is a book called Varduga, Vart Paranormal Nasta Phenomenae, which roughly translates as the Vardogar, the parent, the national paranormal, the, the national paranormal event, or the the normal paranormal, the normal, uh, the national, the North National Norwegian, the national Norwegian paranormal experience. Now, I found out about this on a on an old copy of uh, Fortean Times, not that old, and uh, there's some bits in here, and I went up and looked up the book online. Fortunately, this hundred, this hundred year, this hundred page book is not available in English, which is a shame, and it just kind of pisses me off because it makes you wonder how many of gems like this are not available in English. Now, this was written by George Hagen, and this is what's it's very important, okay? Because this is a book written by an intellectual who was deeply opposed to fluoridation, who realized and discovered that there's more to us in terms of our sleeping and waking cycles 
than just sleeping and waking. It's another version of us, and it ties into the clairvoyance, astral traveling, and being outside our bodies and everything else, and ultimately enlightenment. Now, what's interesting about the Varduga of Varduga is that it's strictly a Nordic phenomenon. In Iceland, it's known as the Freygia, the Fre the Freljia, the Freljia, and the Varduga in Norway or Vardoga in Norway and it's it basically it, it basically is an experience that's it's I've never heard this before it's very interesting but what it basically is is that people who are at home and their loved ones are out out of the house what happens is they hear the sounds of their husband their sons their daughters their boyfriends their friends the roommates coming home about 15 minutes before they actually come home so they would hear the car pull up in the driveway or they would hear them walking from the bus or train station they would hear their foot crunching in the snow they would hear the key being turned in the latch the door being opened the door being closed and having been to Norway many times myself the the Norwegian tradition of taking your shoes off in the hall or the, the sound of a cane being knocked, being put up against a wall, or an umbrella being hung up on a rack. But nobody is there. Then, 15 minutes later, the event happens in reality. What happens is, all the sounds that they've heard 15 minutes previous when nothing happened, happens again, but this time in real space-time, and their loved one comes home. This has been a very well documented and researched phenomena in both Norway and Iceland. A person is heard approaching and entering a house, usually their home. The listener or listeners, often more than one person, can clearly follow the person's progress outside and inside the house until the sounds suddenly stop. On closer inspection, nobody has entered and there is no evidence of anyone having been outside. If it's winter and snowing, which in Norway, it, it will be in Norway and Iceland, there will be several months of the year, it's pretty easy to check because there should be footprints in the snow, tire marks in the driveway, and there's nothing. Now, the Vidogar or the Vidogar, are not seen as scary ghosts. They're called they're called ghosts, but they're not seen as scary ghosts. They're seen as friendly ghosts, but they're not actually ghosts. Because now that, that what they really are is the person the person who's coming home has so much love for their home, so much connectedness to their family members, so much connection, so longing to get home, that another aspect of them arrives home first before them let that sink in they're coming home and they're saying oh i can't wait to see my missus i can't wait to see my beautiful girlfriend i can't wait to sit down and get my shoes off by the fire this sense of love and longing to be home especially in harsh climates such as you have in norway and iceland that another version of them the dream version of them gets home first Here's a quote from the book, page 62. My father was a country doctor up north in his district that had no motor roads. We often heard his sleigh bells as we sat waiting around the paraffin lamp. The front door would open and we heard his footsteps and we put his walking stick away and then nothing. Fifteen minutes later, the sounds would repeat and then he actually arrived. He was so longing to get home out of the cold to his home that the dream state of him, the other side of him, was there first. From page 33 of the book. We girls slept on the first floor. It was always in the evening. We would hear the Vaduga of Vadoga. We used to store our bicycles in the outhouse with a funny old lock that would screech when the key was turned. My sister would often go out while I stayed home, and I heard the lock many times, followed by footsteps on the stairs and along the corridor. Then nothing, until the exact things happened for real 
15 minutes or so later. Page 31. I heard my brother's Badugar Badoga countless times. I heard him enter the hall and walk up the stairs. Upstairs, I heard him open the door and close it again. Then there were no more sounds until he actually arrived 10 to 15 minutes later. I often wondered why I never heard anything like it when my husband came home. Page 16. If I return home later than intended and then think I should have been home by now, the people will, at home will usually hear me arriving cl quite clearly. This again suggests that he thinks of himself, he longs to be home with his family and they hear him because this other part, this makes you think everything about ghosts. That you makes you really think what ghosts are. I, I, I've never really gone for the idea that ghosts are departed spirits of others. I think they're people like you and me in our dream states in other houses. And suppose, like, take a movie like uh, Poltergeist, where all these events are going on. We never uh, really think that these events could be traumatic for the quote-unquote ghost Right? We never think that. But that ghost in a, in a poltergeist experience or, a, or some kind of horrific haunting, that could be you, me, or someone else having a nightmare and sharing that odd nightmare with the other version of us in that other person's house. Page 82. Curiously enough, this is not in the least a bit scary, but the rest of my family have been sceptical until one day... When I was waiting for my husband together with my grown-up son, I heard the usual sounds but said nothing. My son looked up and said, now I have heard it too. And this was George Huygen, the Norwegian intellectual, who did all this research for many, many years, and then, after following it, became the most ardent critic against water fluoridization in Norway. We have gone into something very powerful here. You've not heard this anywhere on alt media that I'm aware of before. And this is why you tune into this show. Because I have people all over the world who feed me this stuff in non-English languages. And when I, fared, when I read about George Heigl's anti-fluoridation crusade in the 1960s, I nearly, fe I nearly fell off my chair, mate. I nearly fell off my chair. Because it finally gave me what could be the answer to why water fluoridization exists and why should we should oppose it. They're making us psychotic and they're killing the other half of us to make us as transhumanist and robot as possible. And that's why socialist ministers and socialist governments have been on the forefront, the forefront of water fluoridization policies all over the world. I want to talk about the discovery of Pluto and particularly Pluto's relationship to the writer H.P. Lovecraft. Now, for some reason, prior to the the flyby of the New Horizon spacecraft past Pluto, I think it was on the 14th of July 2015, which is now the 21st of July 2015, and sent back those amazing pictures. There was a, a growing sense and interest in H.P. Lovecraft's writing. In myself, a revival of such after many years of not being that much into, you know, that forgotten about it. I read several of the stories when I was younger and always had a great admiration for his work. But I had not been listening to the, or reading the story. I don't have time to read anymore. So I listened mainly to old radio broadcasts of the stories and things like audio books. Many of them are superb ones available on YouTube. At the time I did not know that the New Horizons spacecraft was coming to take pictures of close-up shots of, of Pluto which are shown to be quite remarkable but also kind of scary in some ways and disturbing. Now how this ties into, into HP Lovecraft is that Lovecraft a lot of the stories came from nightmares of a planet on the edge of the solar system where these monsters and beings came from that, that entered his consciousness through his own nightmares. And the discovery of Pluto in 1930 made uh, I let uh, Lovecraft state that he believed that his own the planet that he invented himself in, his, in the, the Kul Kulhulu 
mythos, uh, Yugoth, where the, the beings came from, would be found on the edge of the solar system, and there enough it was found in 1930, just as Ludcraft had said. Now, that's interesting enough, okay? That's interesting enough that that happened. But Pluto was also given the name Pluto, which means the Lord of Darkness or the King of the Underworld. Now, if you think of underworld or darkness in the mythological sense, you think of the subconscious. Here we have the manifestation of the dream of the writer, H.P. Lovecraft, not only coming through in 1930, when he basically, he, when he speculated that Yugoth would be, would, was probably Pluto, but also the name of Pluto, and now it's discovery again, just as the consciousness with myself and a few of my friends as well regarding the writings of Lovecraft has has risen, has increased, or shall we say been restored. What is going on? Well, you have groups, guys like the Sync Press, and you have people dealing in synchronicities and synchromysticism who look for these connections and these kinds of links. And I think this is a this is one there's something deep going on here. There's something there's something about this that means something. It's, I know it's a strange thing to say, but there's a a lot of people have an impending sense of dread at the moment. And I, I for the first time in, in years, I've agreed with Alex Jones that there is a, a sense of something is coming. It's hard to put your finger on it. And this was all taking place right before the New Horizons, which is an interesting name for a spacecraft, had flown and taken flown by Pluto and taken those those photographs Lovecraft's own neuroses shall we well, shall we call it that, that that led to his genius was very much based on a kind of a a parochial fear a, a fear of foreigners a fear of things that were outside the comfortable upper middle class lifestyle that he grew up with in Providence in Rhode Island and his his phobia regarding foreigners and and things like that, along with his nightmares, it led to this this unique insight into storytelling that he created, where there was never really a conclusion to many of the stories. You were kind of left in a state of disturbed limbo at the end of the stories and that's how I feel looking at these images and photographs of Pluto that have been recently sent back there's something about that planet that does not sit well with me in these pictures and it also ties in at the same time that these uh, Google deep dream images are all over the internet where people where the basically the, the, the artificial intelligence creates a portrait of you or something based on your Google searches and lots of people have been telling me they've been doing these images themselves and looking at them and not thinking they're cool and fight they're actually feeling quite disturbed by them and many people are also shaken by the images too they often have nightmares they just don't feel right there's something sickly and ugly about them now this happens at the same time new horizons is flying by pluto which is the lord of the underworld which was he featured heavily in the work of H.P. Lovecraft and the nightmares of these cults that worship the the ancient ones, the old ones, these these sort of primordial ancient monsters that lived at the bottom of the oceans and would one day return. Now, looking at that in terms of metaphor, well, I don't actually expect a gigantic, you know, squid-like monster to come out of the of the oceans and attack us but we could be dealing with a kind of a synchronistic upswelling of the darkness of the mass of human consciousness coming to the surface and all the triggers have fallen into place and what also makes that interesting as well is that pluto is an interesting planet in that its orbital its orbital path around the sun it comes within the orbit of neptune so it actually becomes closer to the Earth than Neptune, and we know Neptune is the god of the sea. So we have another synchronistic aspect to it there, to the whole Lovecraftian, the whole idea of these monsters coming from the sea, these new horizons, 
all merging together at the same time as Google Dream. And we were, and you know, everything dreams are very, sorry, deep dream. There's a, there's a strong sense of a consciousness resonance dealing with the repressed or the dormant aspects of the human psyche below the surface. And it's almost like all these things have come to a head with the new horizon flyby of Pluto. You glue all these synchronistic ideas together and you have something that is quite disturbing. And the more I think about it, the more disturbed I have become. It just leaves one more questions that are actually even more disturbing than what's been portrayed or outlined in the narrative of the story. And I get that feeling with the New Horizon pictures of Pluto. I don't know. I, I, I love astronomy. I love astrophysics. I love space uh, exploration. I love. I always get excited when a new planet is discovered, or when a, you know a new 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 photo, especially new photographs of the outer planets comes in. And there's something about Pluto's surface. It looks like an animal or something. It has this almost crocodilian type mountain ranges across its surface that look like skin. I remember Pluto was downgraded from a planet to a minor planet a few years ago, and so there was. And then also Pluto, in the astrological sense, is based on the idea of it purging and cleaning out all the all the hidden garbage, all the repressed garbage. And I believe it, it actually it came into dominance in an astrological sense around two thousand and eight. And here we have we're probably right in the middle of this purging. For such a small planet, and to be so obscure, and on the outs, outs, you know, outside of the universe, on the outside of the solar system, it has, in this century alone, cast a tremendous cultural, social, and psychological shadow across the human condition. And I do feel now that there's something going on here, that the, the old ones are about to reveal themselves in some form but what they are i don't know the narrative will probably re result in one more insight but will also leave us disturbed because we're getting one less answer every so often something happens in my study of the occult I'm reading about russian occult at the moment and slavonic slavonic magic slavonic magic that blows my mind. That absolutely blows my mind. Firm believer in passive magic, and that's CERN in Switzerland, that people are saying it's a place of sorcery and all this stuff. I don't know about that. I'm not, I can't tell for sure, but I think that stuff will happen automatically and passively just by the actual what's going on there. Now, this about the occult of Chernobyl. Now, that may very seem like a very strange thing, but there is a powerful and gigantic passive magical aspect to the nuclear disaster in 1985 that took place in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. I was looking at some books on Slavonic magic and unfortunately we have good records up until the Soviet Union. And then, as usual, Bolsheviks being what they were, they destroyed everything and wiped everything out. But two things, there are scattered things remain. There's pamphlets that, that have been survived, testimonies of mainly aristocrats who escaped. And there's some other books and, stud and academic studies, so on, been done by some people. But it's a very interesting thing how the Bolsheviks basically sought to eliminate the occult and replace it with, with their more, you know, realism. They saw the occult as being bourgeois and decadent. And there's a lot of truth to that because things like theosophy, spiritualism, mediumship and so on. And even things like divination. Although tarot cards were relatively unknown in the Soviet Union uh, for a long time. Which is surprising as because in the original deck the, the emperor looks very much like a, a Russian czar in the traditional dress. So the, the Bolsheviks wiped it out. But the Bolsheviks were extremely interested in the occult. Directly and passively. Now... I have this belief that if you try to go on the occult and take it down, it will take you down. And that's why I think a lot of these people who go around, dismiss it and stuff like that. 
I think there's a lot of lies goes on there. I don't think Harry Houdini taught the occult was nonsense, not for a minute. And I don't think leader Lovecraft did either. I think that those things about them expo- exposing the, the the occult was a cover story. And I'll tell you that the Bolsheviks very much knew that it was going on. Now, before I go into that a little bit deeper, let me talk about Chernobyl, right? Now, many people are aware that the term Chernobyl is also the word for wormwood, which is a, a plant used in a lot of witchcraft and magic. It's also mentioned in the Bible, ironically enough. And Chernobyl is basically translates as wormwood, the place of wormwood. It's basically where they built the the power plant. It was basically an empty landscape, basically very much a, witch, a witching landscape. And the whole city and everything was built there for this massive complex to serve the Chernobyl power plant. Now, what we do know about Slavonic, Slavonic magic, which has been sadly totally wiped out in Russia, it survived much better in the Balkans and places like that. And in Hungary, where even where shamanism has survived, and Poland too, is that there are two magical terms of incantation that are used. These are very similar to abracadabra, the same kind of idea, right? The first one is chur, C-H-U-R, and that means to bind the demon. So in Slavonic magic, when you want to bind a demon, you go chur. It means like keep him out of the magic circle, keep the demon at bay, chur. The other word is to summon a demon, an entity, called the Queen of Serpents, which is a demonic female entity that spews toxins and spews fire. And guess what the name, the incantation is? You guessed it, Chernobyl. Now, I literally fell off my chair when I read that last night, about two o'clock in the morning. That's absolutely quantified. You can look well. You won't look it up. I'm not going to give you the names of all the books I have because I spent a fortune compiling them. And uh, if I ever write it down myself, I will cite the resources. But I can tell you for a fact the two words are Chur and Chernobyl. Now, you look at the Chernobyl site, it was basically one of the great masterpieces, like the Volga Dam, of the Soviet Revolution. It was to prove that technology was triumphant, that the revolution was triumphant, and technology is everything. Now, it was Built on a plane of witchcraft, okay, for starters, the plane of Chernobyl. It was uh, named after Wormwood, which is a witch's herbs. And also we now know that it's also a demon summoning incantation to bring forth the Queen of Serpents. If you look at the, what's happened to Chernobyl thing, when the meltdown the reactor happened, a long pool of concrete, highly radioactive concrete, fell down through the different floors and left a giant snake. And at the end of it is a thing called the elephant's foot. And the elephant's foot is probably the most dangerous thing human beings have ever created on this planet. It's so highly, accidentally, right? it's so highly radioactive that is, if you can't even photograph it properly. Not, well, you get in there for a second, you run out. But it's actually, it's apparently in recent times, it's become decreasingly radioactive. But you look at the secondary sac- sarcophagi they've built over the reactor just to contain this thing. This is the serpent that they conjured up. This is when you, this is passive magic. The Bolsheviks conned it up. Now, this brings us to the other thing. Did they discount magic? Not at all. You had like Soviet, it, the, the, the Bolsheviks were very int- just excuse me, in the occult, in terms of getting into people's brains and mind control. Gorky, the Soviet so- social realist artist who was very involved in using art in order to program people to accept the Soviet philosophy, was uh, was highly interested in, as, as were many early other Soviets, including top KGB people, was the NKPD back then, in getting, using the occult and using things that were developing around that time, like hypnosis, in order to mind control people. So Sovietism and socialism was built on the idea that it doesn't matter what the people want to believe, we'll make them believe through any means possible. Propaganda is good enough, but what they really sought to use was the occult. What they really wanted to use was magic. And of course, their sorcery was poor quality, and it failed. It failed in two ways. In two ways, one, they couldn't contain the people anymore. Everyone knew it. Was. And secondly, there was an occult war that took place prior to the Soviet Revolution. We had the, the deterioration and psychic breakdown of the Romanov family. We had the arrival of people like such as uh, such as um, 
it's Rasputin. And the Romanov uh, castle, or it, the, the Winter Palace, it was basically a shrine to occultism and witchcraft. They were desperately trying to offset an, a curse that was that was set for the, uh, the that present Nikola and Alexandria the Tsar and Tsarina, that they would be destroyed. And uh, they were, he would be basically a the, the reincarnation of of Peter or Job, the long suffering. It's very interesting stuff. The Soviets and the Russians and the occult stuff is really fascinating, but it's a huge, huge, huge subject. It's it's taken me a while just to even get this far into it. A lot of it is very badly translated documents and books. That, and and also there are Western sources and they tend to be extremely academic and they they like they put things down like oh it's just a coincidence that. It's Chernobyl and this kind of thing. But it's, it is worth going into. And we'll be exploring this topic further. So when people... Also, another thing about Chernobyl is... You, you know I've written a book called Valpurgis Night. And there's a strange history of things happening on Valpurgis Night. Basically, the, the National Socialist, another version of socialism... Uh, launched its, its existence on Valpurgis Night... In the weekend of Valpurgis Night Beltane in Munich in 1919, Hitler, the witch king of the National Socialist, the Black Hexon witch king, Hexon witch king, he took flight to his mountains on Valpurgis Night in 1945. Now, lo and behold, it turns out in 1995, the World Wide Web was launched by CERN on Valpurgis Night, April 30th. But more interestingly, the Soviet news agency took until April 30th to make an official announcement to the world and the Western media and their own media when TASS announced that the Chernobyl reactor had gone into meltdown, meltdown and a critical situation was now facing Europe. And these things don't happen by accident. That's passive, mag passive magic. This is what makes me worry a little bit about CERN. This is what I'm concerned about CERN is that Although the people in there, and a lot of them, funny enough, the early founders, a lot of them were, you know, if not commies, were commie sympathizers from the UK and stuff like that. People connected to the Cambridge Five, a very dubious bunch under the guise of uh, Lord Rothschild. Now, all these names I know keep coming back, but here we have it. Absolute quantifiable uh, proof of passive magic in terms of the Chernobyl uh, event. They created a demon called the Queen of Serpents, which actually manifested as this long string of molten, highly radioactive concrete that culminated in the most dangerous object, in, sense, in a sense, the tongue of the serpent, the elephant's foot at the bottom of the corridor, that's so radioactive that cameras even melt when they come near it, and is, is contained in a giant sarcophagi, which is essentially a magic triangle to hold a demon. So basically they've gone from Chernobyl to Chur. Now I looked up Chur. There is it, and see if there's any can. Because I knew there was a city in Switzerland called uh, Chur, and I wanted to see if there was any connections to Chernobyl or sorry CERN. It's on the exact opposite side of Switzerland. Chur is on the exact, couldn't be further away from from Geneva and and uh, CERN. But interesting enough, it does have some kind of powerful occult connections. One of them being H.R. Geiger, the brilliant but very strange artist. We know from Alien, and a remarkable artist, but it's just, his, his stuff is, he's even done his own version of the Necronomicon, his stuff is definitely occult and, you know, demonic in nature, And uh, but he comes from Chur. So, where the Bolsheviks tried to destroy magic, and they went to Chernobyl, they shouted Chur, and they ended up with Chernobyl. And then you tell me that magic in the occult is in real? It is. Bye.